One final example of legalism today. You'll notice that all religions in the world, apart from Christianity, are works or law-based religions, meaning they teach that you have to fulfill certain obligations to be made right with God. The general idea behind all religion is that if you do enough good works, then that will outweigh your bad ones and you'll get a reward from God in the next life. We've already seen how silly the concept is that good deeds can atone for bad ones. It's like a murderer hoping to escape jail because he helped a lot of old ladies across the street. But the main point I want to make here is that works-based religions are by their very nature legalistic. So for example, in Islam, you have to pray five times a day to stay right with Allah. In contrast, Christians have no set times and can pray spontaneously and authentically as often as they like. Muslims can only eat halal meat, but Christians can eat anything with a clear conscience and thanksgiving. Muslims must fast during the month of Ramadan. Christians can fast as often as they like as the spirit moves them or as the situation requires. Islam says you have to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Christianity has no such rule, although our love of Jesus makes us intrigued to see where he lived and preached. Legalism burdens people with lists of minimum requirements designed to make yourself acceptable to God. Freedom under the law of Christ, on the other hand, says your good works can't make God love you any more or any less than he already does. He already loves you so much that he died on a cross for you. All that's left for you to do is love him authentically, spontaneously and extravagantly in return. A relationship with Christ stands alone as something completely different to religion. Religion is the story of man trying to work his way towards God. Christianity is the story of how God has already reached down to man, fulfilling all requirements on our behalf and offering us a free gift of grace. Jesus has taken the burden off our shoulders and nailed them to the cross. I was watching the news recently where a reporter was explaining what life had been like in Afghanistan under the Islamic Taliban regime. He said that because of their severe legalism, no one in Afghanistan was allowed to sing or dance, music was banned, people were bizarrely banned from having photographs of living things and they weren't allowed to play any form of sport. I also saw that in Somalia, the national football team still have to play their matches in secret because the Muslim group Al-Shabaab threatened to kill those who play the game, believing it to be a tool of the devil. They won't even tolerate it being watched on TV. That's an example of the heavy oppression of legalism and you'll find it in all religions to some extent apart from genuine spirit-filled Christianity. That is why we Christians sometimes object to Christianity being labelled a religion and insist on calling it a relationship with God instead. Although it's strictly true to call Christianity a religion in the sense that it answers the questions of where we came from, what our purpose in life is and how we gain salvation, the word religion has baggage which evokes ideas of legalistic rules, rituals and minimum requirements because that's generally what other religions are all about. That's not Christianity though. Christians prefer the term relationship to describe our faith because it evokes a more accurate sense of free interaction with God via the Holy Spirit. This is also why we Christians don't believe in mantras, vain repetition, dead ritual, liturgy and set prayer books. Saying endless Hail Marys in an attempt to absolve sins has no use for us. Do you speak to your friends by repeating words endlessly? No? Then why a living God? Jesus said, when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. We are after truth, authenticity, deep relationship and spontaneous worship. We want to engage with God as the living being that he is. John Eldridge wrote, there are no formulas with God, period, so there are no formulas for a man who follows him. God is a person, not a doctrine. He operates not like a system, not even a theological system, but with all the originality of a truly free and alive person. Do you feel how easy and light Jesus' yoke is yet? Do you see how little he burdens you? Am I managing to communicate this to you? Do you feel the oppressive weight of the law coming off your shoulders here? Jesus doesn't force you to meet mountains of rules. Instead, he gives you freedom and then says, use that freedom to love others like I love you. And that is all. 
When you follow the law of Christ, you will automatically fulfill the eternal moral law. You will never murder, lie, steal, cheat, commit adultery, idolatry, or revel in sin of any kind. The moral law is strengthened, not weakened under the law of Christ. The old law of Moses was in fact morally inferior to the new way. And what is more, you now have freedom to use neutral things for his glory. You can use your freedom in things like money, food, drink, musical instruments, clothes, days, seasons, years and holidays to do the best you can for God. Indeed, everything you think, say and do will automatically start to align with God's will. And as you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, your conscience will be sharpened, your desires will change and you will start to be transformed into a new person. You will be sanctified. All this will happen without any need for excessive rules or ritual and the change will be lasting because it will be internal. It will come from within rather than being imposed from without. God will place a new responsive and tender heart in his followers by his spirit as he promised to do long ago. We are indeed called to live under the spirit, not under the law. Stay free.